Although our uh, sanctification is a continual process, there is a sense in which we are continually becoming to a greater degree more and more set apart from the things which are unlike our Savior and would conflict with life and godliness. There's also a sense in which our sanctification was something accomplished once and for all by Christ on the cross. That point marked the beginning of this setting apart. It provided the means by which this was to happen. Uh, this sacrifice sanctified the people to God. And in and re and reconciliation, there is the idea of making those who were once at enmity with one an another to be at peace. And justification is the idea of legitimizing man in the sight of God, so to speak, to, to the degree that they might be just and righteous in their conduct. To be able to live in a manner when, when evaluated by God, that they, they, they might be seen by him to be, to be found to be, in fact, holy. And in sanctification, this man which has been justified, this man which has been reconciled, has been brought to this state for the sole purpose of serving the one whom has brought this change to pass. Sanctification is, is about just that, setting them apart for the purpose of glorifying God, which has redeemed them from all iniquity. Uh, continuing in our verse, the apostle tells us how this sanctification was accomplished in us, uh, the, the point at which it came to pass, so to speak, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, as Brother Jonathan has just spoke to us of this will by which we have been sanctified, I wanted to underline this again, that this will, this purpose, this divine intention and design can be seen in all of these things in the working out of his purpose. Uh, men were created by the will of God. They were made to be wholly set apart and used by God. That was the purpose for which man was created, for God's good pleasure, for him. They were made for him. But because of the entrance of sin into the world, men served themselves, and they worshiped the creator, or they worshiped the creature rather than the creator. And thus they were, they were given over to vile affections and lusts. And so widespread was the implication and consequence of this evil that even the natural creation in which men lived was made subject to this corruption. Men, as a result of sin, actually lived in direct contradiction to the purpose for which they were created. So then, by this will also, an offering had to be made. That there had been a transgression, a trespass, a violation. It couldn't simply be ignored or swept away. God couldn't simply just wipe it off the slate. It had to be dealt with accordingly. There wasn't simply a rule that had been broken. There wasn't a commandment that had been broken simply. It was, more, it was more complicated than that. See, God had invested his own image in humanity. And that image had been marred in the fall. So, so God himself in this, the, in this there had been an, there, now there's an occasion for the wicked one to have sort of an accusation. If, if God doesn't have this resolved... That now there's a problem. So, so in, in salvation, there has to be a means by which God is justified in this. Amen. So not only does a man have to be released from this impending sentence of guilt from their sin, but they also have to be released from this corruption that held them in this bondage to the law of sin and death. And the most marvelous thing, however, is that we can see in all of this that his will is omnipresent. That we see that in something that may seem uh, to be, to, to the casual onlooker, to be chaotic and out of control. This, this thing that happened in the fall as man has fallen into depravity. It may seem like this is all out of control and chaotic. That God is in control of all of this. This, this fall didn't take God at unawares. He did not know that this not was going to happen. God is in control of all of this. This is all in truth completely orderly. This offering was actually, in fact, planned meticulously before the world even began. The scripture testifies that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. 
Now, there are all manner of vague things that are said about salvation, so I want to be precise today as it concerns Christ. Uh, as, and, and exactly what point where the atonement was made. And that was on the cross in his own body. Yeah. Uh, some, some have said that uh, we are accounted the righteousness of Christ. And that he fulfilled the law on his life on earth. And that, that's why we are saved is because we are, we are accounted that. Or some say just merely because of the physical pain and agony of the cross. That, that, that's the reason why. Or some also refer to this text in Isaiah 53. They say that the, the stripes that the Roman soldiers put upon him, that those are the stripes by which we, are, we were healed. Where, where it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we had did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. However, we find that Scripture is, is very specific when it speaks on this subject. And I, I never really made the connection between these two texts uh, until I was studying on this. I knew, I knew the truth of it, but I, I'm glad that I made this connection. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Uh, these bruises and these stripes that Isaiah, Isaiah spoke of were stripes that no man could place upon Christ. They were stripes that only he was fit to bear. They were stripes that were the, this was the chastisement of our peace. This was the punishment which no man would be ever able to bear. The punishment that was dealt by God himself. This was the result of the divine outpouring of wrath against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men. It, it was the judgment of sin, the putting away of sin. For any man that may question how severely God feels about sin, they need no look, look no further than to look at these stripes. So then, the offering, the sin-bearing itself, took place upon the tree. Not in the garden or leading up to the crucifixion, or even when the Savior carried his cross up to Golgotha, weak and bruised. It was at this place and at that time. Now the Spirit even speaks more expressly, elaborating more, telling us that not only was this offering made on the tree, but more specifically it was made in his own body. Now I wanted to say a few words about this body because Christ's body is a very unique body. This was a body unlike any other body before. Now this is actually a body that was considered before the world began as well. It was, it was a prepared body. One that would be a vessel to carry these, these sins of the world, to, to bear the guilt of the entire race of man. And actually in Hebrews 10, five verses before the one which we're covering today, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. See, every other person who had been born was born to live, but Christ was born to die. This, this was his purpose for coming into the world. Now, there was a reason why it had to be done this way. This wasn't just uh, off the cuff, so to speak. Sin had been committed in a body, so sin had to be judged in a body. Mankind could not be redeemed by the death of one who was not a proper representative of the race. Goats and lambs and bulls, this was not a proper representative. All the blood of the multitudes of sacrifices, all of these countless deaths couldn't even pay for one single sin. Animals could not pay for the price of this iniquity because they couldn't bridge the gap between God and man. Amen. They were not made in the image of God. These sacrifices served only as a reminder to God of the sacrifice to come. Every single one of these sacrifices were like an aid to the long-suffering of God. They were pointing forward to the sacrifice to come. Like, God, it's coming. The sacrifice is coming. The atonement is going to be made. Your son is coming. Uh, two texts here in Hebrews 2 and Romans 8.13. This is uh, just describing the nature of, of, of his body. 
For then as much as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise also took part of the same, and uh, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now we notice that uh, um, he took part of the same. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And he, he was not a man like you and I are a man. We must, must be careful about the way that we say this. Uh, he, he did not have a father and a mother like you and I have a father and a mother. So the, the corruption that had pa been passed down through the race of Adam, he didn't get that corruption. The, 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 the bloodly lineage, the fleshly lineage ended, ended with Christ. He was the seed of the woman, which was prophesied of in Genesis 3.15. Now how marvelous a consideration is it, brethren, that God, the Word... The one who was with God and the one who was God left his station from heaven itself and was made subject to the creation that he himself had created. And, and doing so with the full knowledge that in order for him to accomplish this salvation, to, re, to retrieve his creation from sin and corruption, that he would have to submit himself to hunger, to, to weakness, to fatigue and pain. Um, what, what love and what mercy is this that, that he would do such a thing for us, brethren? Not, not only would he have to submit himself to the death of the cross, but to become perfect in his role of the captain of their salvation, he, in this he would have to be able to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities so that he might be able to be a merciful and faithful high priest to us in things concerning God. You know? It's not that he was imperfect in, in his own nature. It's that he had never experienced any of these things before. In, in being in very nature God, he, he never experienced pain or weakness or anything like this. So then in this offering, we can see uh, God's perfect design, not only in this in atonement, as Brother Jonathan has told us, but in the, in the means by which it was done as well. God is glorified in the... In the uh, working out of it and in the, the means as well. Uh, this was done once, once and for all. Now from the standpoint of heaven, the sacrifice of Christ was wholly and entirely effective. It was final and it was complete. It was pleasing to God in every aspect. The blood of his sacrifice was brought before God in heaven just as the priest brought the blood of the sacrifice into the holy place. And there it exists before him as a continual reminder of the sacrifice which was made, the atonement that was wrought. The price of our redemption, the precious lifeblood of our Savior, paid the debt which none could hope to pay. Amen. And it should be noted that this was a one-time event. Christ is not continually paying this price. It was paid in full on that day. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then he must have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Amen. From our perspective and the receiving of the atonement, there, there was a point at which we were redeemed. And as we live our lives, we are being progressively perfected in our holiness as we walk our pilgrim pathway through life. And our sanctification in our experience is not a one-time event. However, our confidence and assurance that we have the power to be able to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord, to be able to more fully be conformed to his image and to be brought into a place where we are more and more like him is founded upon the declaration of what was accomplished once and for all when he offered his body on the tree. That, that is our, the capstone, is that we, we are looking forward to, 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 that, to that thing that happened once and for all. That is the foundation. That is our confidence. That we are now receiving of the benefits and the resources which can be made available, made available because of what happened. Because of what Christ accomplished in our behalf. What we're talking about in this renewal. In that one event. Now elaborating on this in, in the text that we're in in Hebrews 10. In uh, 
verses 11 through 14, he says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. You understand this isn't a sitting down of rest. This is a sitting down of a station of power. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now the apostle says something here in verse 14 that may seem at first to be contradictory. If we are being perfected, and if we are in the process of continual perfection, how can it could be said that he has perfected forever them that are sanctified? Now, living in a realm where we are bound by the limits of time, from our perspective, it doesn't seem to be so. But in the sacrifice and laying down his life and taking of the, on the sin of the world in his body on that day, as far as God was concerned, the provision was made. It was done. From that day forward, no man at any time would come to God any other way but through his son, Christ Jesus. There is no other way of perfection. There is no other way of holiness. Christ is the means by which men are made acceptable in the sight of God forever. Those who are set apart to God by him, those who are called according to his purpose, the church, the bride of Christ, the lamb's wife, they are perfected forever by the sacrifice which Christ has made and by it alone. There is no other fountain open for cleansing. Well, the hymn writers say, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Now, this is the very reason why we're taking time to declare these things this week, brethren. Because the declaration of what Christ has already accomplished in our salvation is the basis upon which all of our confidence and hope is founded. And no amount of programs or books or anything else can produce the result in the hearts and minds of people that preaching and declaring uh, this thing, uh, preaching and declaring these things can do. Uh, uh, to quote the men of the day of Pentecost, uh, uh, just declaring the wonderful works of God uh, work, can do so much more work than any of these other things ever can. Thank you, brother.